Globus. Thanks for joining us today uh, in this session. I think we have a, a great, diverse uh, uh, panel today to discuss uh, our topic of tech business and how to harness new ideas into sustainable ventures. You know, I'd like to kick off by you know, asking uh, a question to all of you or to, uh, as a show of hands uh, to see what kind of background you all have. Um, can you raise your hand if you're working for a large corporation? Okay, well, pretty good crowd. Uh, working for a startup or running your own business? Investors? Okay. So we have a good, diverse uh, a crowd on hand today. Um, I'd like to kick off uh, by asking, you know, Jonathan, I think you've been working uh, in and out of uh, Japan and Asia uh, in investing and running your own uh, uh, venture. You know, what has actually changed, you know, in the last maybe 15, 20 years, not just in Japan, but in Asia, uh, regarding, you know, the startup world, uh, the landscape and the climate and how you view or how you feel the market has changed? Well, in addition to the, to the primary change that I notice in the mirror every morning with gray hair, um, <laughs> I, um, I notice that it's not just my gray hair, um, but that 20 years ago, when we were talking about Bit Valley, um, the entrepreneurs were teenagers or right out of college um, and, and very eager, um, but not very realistic about how businesses can start. But what's happened in the venture environment here is that over this time, there, have, there are now a set of, of seasoned entrepreneurs, of people who've come out of, of big uh, companies to start their own companies. Um, there's still a lot of failures. Um, but there are some successes as well. Um, and so I think the, the overall market is becoming more mature. It's still, of course, on a much, much smaller level um, and a, a lower level than you would find in, in a number of countries. Um, but, but that change, I think, is clear. Uh, there are also a lot more uh, venture capitalists, and there's more money that's going to, uh, to startups. Um, a lot of it is, uh, is CVCs, is corporate venture capital. Um, there are a couple of, of independent um, uh, venture capitalists, and, and Globus is, is certainly one of the most prominent ones uh, of those. Um, but more is needed, and, uh, and uh, I guess um, more, a more international focus, I think, both among entrepreneurs and uh, among venture capitalists is, is I think, uh, critical for the success. Um, because this ultimately is, is one market. Um, and there are huge neighbors uh, in China and India who are, who are birthing uh, new ventures and world beaters on not a daily basis, but on a regular basis. And um, it's, it's, it's really a challenge to, I think, the whole Japanese economy to, to try to, um, to, to start up some major companies in that space. And, and they need international help in order to do that. Thank you. I think uh, one key word that just popped up in your uh, in the statement was uh, the word Vit Valley. Yeah. I think, Teru, you were in the middle of that uh, <laughs> back 20 years ago. Uh, and as well, uh, I think Jonathan touched upon more globalization, especially here uh, from a Japanese perspective. Uh, how have you, you know, as an entrepreneur, I think, Teru, seen the changes, uh, not just here in Japan, but now you're investing in a lot of Asian countries or Asian startups. Sure. How do you see the difference in the changes over the last 20 years? Right. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me here with the panel. Um, uh, just start talking about the Japanese startup ecosystem, just to give you some number. I'm pretty optimistic about the, the startup ecosystem here. It's getting depth. Uh, the depth is getting uh, deeper. Uh, width is also getting wider. Uh, so last year, we had uh, 85 IPOs uh, in Japan. And the venture capital investment was $2 billion dollar in startups that was actually double of uh, five years back. And then we, I also checked the M&A and uh, the investment activity, activity, activities by the corporations was uh, 340, which is actually 6x compared to four, four, four years back. So when we talk about, uh, and then as Jonathan said, like CBC, angel, angel, the world, world angel investment is also getting perceived pretty common, common language, which was not obvious like 20 years back when I launched my first company. 
So I think overall the uh, ecosystem has been really nurtured and uh, get a little bit more depth. But uh, uh, scale, when you compare the scale, uh, so I'm actually investing heavily in the country like India and Southeast Asia. And uh, there are 20, 252 unicorns. Uh, unicorns is defined as uh, the company which is valued more than $1 billion non-public company. Uh, uh, 252 companies, uh, unicorns in the world, uh, and actually 80 percentage of those are from China and India. Uh, sorry, China and uh, US. Uh, and uh, if you look at in Japan, uh, it's actually one, or maybe Swimmy's company will be the second one <laughs> for sure. But it's actually one, uh, which is Mercari, which could be valued more than one billion. So, so rest is still uh, uh, under process. And uh, uh, when you look at India, for example, or India already has uh, 10 uh, unicorns, and actually two out of 10 are Decacons. Decacons is $10, 10 billion. Uh, when you even look at Southeast Asia, uh, like country like Indonesia, Vietnam, there are actually 10 unicorns. Actually, and the three of those are actually three to $4 billion market cap. Uh, so when you compare the scale of the, the impacts of uh, startups uh, across the Asian region, uh, even though oh, I'm pretty optimistic about Japanese startup ecosystem compared to 10 years back, 20, 20 years back, but I think we have a long way to go. And there has to be something uh, that has uh, uh, to be changed or uh, somehow really addressed to, to make a change in the future. So that's my just uh, first yeah. impression. Yeah, okay. Um, you know, I've been running my startup for the last eight years and when we started in 2009, the, the word startup was almost like Death Valley. It wasn't Bit Valley. <laughs> why, why are you starting a, a, you know, a startup after Lehman Shock? Uh, but things have changed. Uh, we, we were able to raise $50 million last year uh, from CVCs and, um, and Globus as well. Uh, but I think it's a good time to, to be an entrepreneur. It's a good time to be working at startups. I, I've always said that you don't really have to be the first person. Um, you can join, be a good follower, and start up a, a new uh, startup here in Japan. But I want to uh, uh, have Alex uh, give his views. And Alex runs uh, Red Herring, which is a very global publication that's been, you know, uh, promoting and supporting startups over a number of years. You know, Alex, from your point of view, how does Japan or how does Asia, uh, in terms of startup, uh, how does that look to you? Well. Uh, thank you for having me, and uh, given what I do and this incredible audience and quality audience, I'm just going to keep myself by, by just giving you numbers, right? And that helps. So we, the, the herring started 25 years ago. Actually, SoftBank at one point in time was a shareholder. Um, the red herring scouts about uh, 1,800 companies which become red herring 100 in America. 1,500 companies in Asia and 1,200 companies every day, every year in Europe. So that means that we talked to all those companies one by one by one, and we select the best 100 in each continent. Now, uh, we have been doing that for 25 years continuously uh, in America and since 2003 in Asia and since 1999 in Europe. A, in Asia, we have a, a clear footprint, we see that, as you said, that companies are either Chinese or they are Indian. So they are somehow, sometimes Korean. They are somehow Southern, is, is Southern Asia and Singapore, et cetera, et cetera. But the proportion of Japanese companies, which are great successes, unicorn, decacorn, minicorn, uh, is very remote. Why? Uh, and we talked about it earlier when we were preparing, and, and I'm sure that that was not very popular when I was saying that. And if allow me to be the one bringing controversy here. Japan is too big of a country. Japan is too great of a country. It has an incredible history and has done what economic revolution. I used to be a university professor. And has done such a great revolution from 1950 to 1990 one of the most incredible economic transformation ever in the economic history in the world. I cannot understand why today Japan is behind the technology train. And that is not fair because A, it has capital. B, 
It is the third country in terms of PhD per capita. It is the country which has the most people who graduate from high school in the world, according to UNESCO. So it has a lot of it, and it has a huge backbone with large public companies and multi-billion dollar companies export driven. The only reason why we can say that, and I'm just going to be finishing in one second, is the only reason why we can, we can make that diagnostic is to say that maybe Japanese are not as hungry as other people, the Chinese, the Indians, and the other people in Asia. Definitely, they don't have this hunger that people have in Silicon Valley where I live. When every kid in Silicon Valley doesn't want to work at Microsoft, not even work at HP, definitely not. They're going to say, please, don't, don't insult me, right? <laughs> say, they want to work for their own startups. The whole thing that I learned when I left Europe to go to America is that you want to create your own destiny. And I think that people in this country want to follow other people's destiny. Thank you, Alex. I think, uh, Amy, you're, you've been heavily involved in education and you know, uh, a lot of topics surrounding diversity. You know, I think Alex mentioned uh, some key words surrounding you know, higher education and how kids perceive startups or how you know, uh, people work. You know, if you have any comments, especially with your you know, extreme background in that field, you know, feel free to, to mention anything that uh, you felt about what Alex mentioned. Uh, uh, sure. Uh, sorry. Before I start, thank you so much for having me here today. It's really such an honor to be with such a distinguished audience and panelists. And um, I have a, um, I don't have a unicorn company in my back pocket, but I do have a startup experience of about six, seven years. And now for the past two years or so, I'm transitioning myself more and more to education to help foster the next generation of uh, global entrepreneurs and leaders. Um, so in my experience, um, the, the challenge, if, if you see a lot of the Japanese entrepreneurs, including Sumi-san, who's quite successful, is a lot of them have international backgrounds. Either they've studied in the States, or they do have enormous hunger for success, like Alex was mentioning. You know, some of those uh, top entrepreneurs, they have a very difficult upbringings, uh, right? But it's very hard to, you know, kind of generate the environment where, okay, I'm going to let you grow up very difficult environment because I want you to be successful. I mean, Japanese uh, saying, we have a, a saying called like uh, um, the, the tiger, you know, the mom tiger would, would drop the kid tiger in a valley so that the, the, the you know, tiger would survive and, you know, learn this like surviving skills. But in reality, you know, I'm a mom of two kids and I don't want to drop my kids into the valley, right? <laughs> I want them to be happy, right? And Japan has a really a wonderful social uh, security system and great school systems and very comfortable environment and, and a very uh, defined path for success up until now. And... A lot of the parents and you know people in my generation don't recognize the world is changing right in front of eyes, and you know fourth industry generations coming, and you know the AI is going to be a everyday thing. Not many parents know that yet, and I think most school teachers don't want to recognize that that you know the whole computing things is is encroaching into the school system. They want to be with the blackboard and you know they want to be teaching them all the knowledges that they've acquired in the past. So I think it just need we need to kind of admit that and um, start allowing experiments. I think it's very difficult for Japan to change as a whole uh, all of a sudden. But we do have very talented students and very creative students and you know uh, I think we need to have certain education environment, at least in the pockets of areas in Japan, and foster, you know, start creating role models in those experimental environment. And once we start having role models, the good thing about Japan is we're very good at executing, right? So once we start seeing some role models, and then maybe the, the, the spreading will be fast. Thank you, Amy. I think, Terry, you've been traveling around uh, Southeast Asia and Asia, especially India. You know, wh what do you think is the difference? You know, I think Alex uh, touched upon 
uh, some other countries and the differences between these countries. Um, the changes in the uh, perception of startups or starting up your own company, especially in technology, from, say, India and Japan or Southeast Asia and Japan. What, what, what kind of mentality uh, do you see the difference between some of these countries? Well, I mean, it's a kind of a pretty obvious mm -hmm. question and answer. Uh, so I also often speak at the tech conferences or any of those conferences in India as a Japanese who has been heavily investing in India. And then, of course, I talk about a little bit of Japan. But uh, uh, the uh, perception of uh, starting new, because this, I mean, I wouldn't, I, 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 I have my Indian friend here, so <laughs> I, I, but, uh, you know, be a little bit careful about uh, what I say. But, uh, uh, you know, I think there's nothing. You know, in India, there has been actually, of course, uh, uh, the population is there, but there are a bunch of, bunch of problems which are unsolved for many years. And then tech entrepreneurs or entrepreneurs in general are just ready to do it because government hasn't done any. I mean, not any, but not much. So I think they, if we consider innovation as a, uh, a necessity, as a mother of innovation, uh, there is a huge uh, amount of necessity laying down in the society. Uh, which actually uh, could be... It's a bit more complex than that, my friend. <laughs> oh, well, I mean, I would yeah. also love to learn more about no, Israel. No, no, but, but, but there are 245,000 engineers and extremely good engineers in India. Yeah. That number, it's a big number. Yes. So when you have 245,000 yeah. engineers in a country, that changes the whole... I perception of scientific background. Yeah, I totally agree, actually. Um, uh, so actually, I invested about 50% of capital to India market. That's actually, it shows how I look at the market. Uh, as, as you said, one million new uh, graduates in uh, engineering popping up from India, and they all speak English. And uh, the largest data science uh, uh, company called Mu Sigma, uh, that's a brilliant company, billion dollar business. Uh, they have uh, 4,000 uh, data scientists uh, in Bangalore, which is the largest number of the engineers. So yes, I agree. And also risk capital wise in India, uh, it was last year $5 billion uh, venture capital investment in tech industry. So it's a composition of all of those uh, uh, structures. But uh, 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 I think this uh, under this G1 uh, concept or philosophy, I think we should uh, a little discuss about the what would be the practical solutions, the potential solutions for this society to, 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 to harness the, the startup ecosystem. So anyway, just uh, I, I, I understand you know, your, your points, but I think that's actually my understanding. So there's a significant difference uh, in, in culture and the structural background or economic background in, in some of those countries like India. So Alex, uh, you know, I think you have a lot of knowledge across you know, the world in terms of how different companies play out in terms of harnessing or promoting new startups or ventures. What are some countries that you feel are doing it the right way? America? Uh, Israel? In, in, in what part, like, in but, what for sense? For example, Jonathan was talking about it. He said that people have gray hair now today compared to 25 years ago. When I started being an entrepreneur, I took my first company public. It was just after Stanford Business School. I was a young kid. I didn't know anything. I didn't even know how to spell money, right? So today, the people who are CEOs in America are 45-year-old guys who ramp up. When you look at top 100 red airing, those are companies which go from 40 to 70 million in one year and 100% growth rate. They reach 100 million in four and a half years. It's an amazing situation. So what I'm telling you is not just countries. It's also the way people operate and operationalize the companies. You have never seen in, in human history, it took 100 years to Coca-Cola to become a $100 million company. It took three and a half years to Facebook, right? So just to give you numbers, it tells you that the way companies scale and the way how fast they scale, and because they have people who are very seasoned, it scales better and scales more efficiently and it scales globally. Now. Japan, to be, to be positive, Japan has many ingredients that it could use. I don't know because I only spend five, four, five, six days a year in Japan, so I cannot tell you what happens in 360 years a day. But I can tell you that there's something, obviously, that should be done 
to harness and to maximize this incredible, as you said, intellectual capital, education, and people at home. And so people understand that working for Matsushita or working for Murata is a great thing. It's a great company. But it would be better for the young Keio universities or Todai universities to go and work with a smart startup, right? Every 60% of the kids who come, came out in July 2017 at Stanford are working on startups. That tells you. So I'm done. Great. Uh, Jonathan, you've been investing not just in Japan, but around the world, especially Israel. I think uh, is an interesting uh, model case for Japan or any other uh, country around the globe uh, that's looking into growing their startup community or ecosystem. You know, how do you see, you know, some of these countries, other countries who are successful in implementing, you know, startup uh, uh, strategies or uh, political, you know, aspirations? What, 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 what would you say about that? Let's, let's take Israel to start with, right? Israel didn't start out saying, we're going to be the startup nation, right? It was a nation of, of immigrants, of refugees, um, running away from World War II. Um, most of them had, or a lot of them had, you know, numbers tattooed on their, on their arms um, because they had run away from the, from the gas chambers, right? Or survived them or whatever. Um, they came with just a desire to survive. But they came with, with such incredible willpower forged in that, in that, um, in hell right, that they built a nation. And at the same time, they were willing to accept any kind of um, defeat in order just to keep going, right? So failure was not a problem. They were used to failure. They were used to death, right? It's a country that, that doesn't see failure as a, as a block to success. Um, and out of that was born, and, and of course, there's also a natural interest in, in education and um, dedication to the family and desire to build, you know, to, to, to continually invest in oneself, right, um, educationally. That worked in Israel, and it works in Israel today, right? It is now the, by far the most, um, you know, successful startup uh, environment in the world per capita. But that's not Japan. And I agree that you don't have to go through you know, death camps in order to, to have that kind of success, right? That's not what I would suggest at all, right? Instead, you've got to look to your own strengths. And there are tremendous strengths in Japan. Um, and one of them is being able to learn from abroad and rapidly adapt and not just copy, but, but perfect a technology from overseas. And so one of the things that I've focused on in the companies that I've helped start here um, are companies not with exclusively uh, Japanese entrepreneurs, with an international um, startup environment, people who have, um, who have a view of how things work in different countries, right? And, um, and with an eye towards expanding their business in Japan, yes, because it's a huge market, but also expanding overseas. So. Um, Money Tree, one of the companies that I helped start, is now has has made some success in Japan and is now expanding to Australia. Um, another uh, company called Cloudian, all similarly started in Japan, and has now expanded to the United States with um, some major investors like Intel Capital and um, and Lenovo. But I do think that going back to the Israel point, one thing is there are a couple of things that are necessary. One is this ability to get past failure and to, and to tough it out. Because raising money, for instance, is it's a process of failure after failure after failure. Because most of the response that you get is no, go away. right? Um, and, when, and there are always bigger competitors. And you can't get discouraged by the fact that there's a bigger competitor or that your technology is inferior or that your access to the sales um, to the market is inferior, you have to find a way around. Um, and so that ingenuity and that, I don't know what you call it, stick-to-itiveness, right, 
is, is I think, a critical part. And so that's what I look for in people who I invest in, is the ability to, to deal with some hardship, not necessarily on the scale of Israel. Thank you. Um, Emi san, as a mother of two, two kids, and especially, especially in your focus towards changing how uh, you know, kids and students are educated here in Japan, especially, um, you know, just elaborating on Jonathan's point, you know, what do you think, like, with the principles of, you know, the G1 global concept, you know, what kind of proposal would you make uh, in order to change how kids are trained and educated here in Japan? Um, so first of all, I think we need to start treating kids not as kids. Kids have tremendous potential, and if you look at the global data, um, the creativity of kids um, in general and kind of more of a cram-based education unfortunately peaks at around age 10, and our current education systems kind of hammer them out of creativity over years until they're done with college. So if if we start really believing their abil ability to, to be creative, you know, the third grade kids can be have most creative ideas probably to solve some of the biggest world challenges. And I think we're not harnessing the power and ability of kids uh, enough today because the schools are in separate areas and it's in silos and it's not connecting to societies. And if you look at the example of Israel, actually, um, there is a chain of uh, democratic schools, and they have 30 schools funded fully by the government. So the kids can go to these schools, and so, um, they, ha they work on real-world projects, like uh, you know, a company wants kids to solve alternative energy issue, and kids will come up with a project, and the craziest idea will win the award, and they will actually get funded for these projects. And it's not very difficult to implement some of these kind of industry uh, school collaborations once we start believing in kids, right? They, we stop treating kids as pure kids. Because if they have willingness, right, and they have very low risk profile, you know, they're with parents or, you know, um, the, the good thing about Japan is most high school students are not living on the street. So once they're given opportunity to and feel that they can impact and change the world, uh, millennials across globe, they want to see themselves impacting and contributing to the change of society, but we're not giving them the opportunities. So I hear the MIT Media Lab nowadays, they are they're, they're actually hiring high school graduate researchers because maybe our school system is hammering them out of creativity through the higher ed. And uh, I know, in fact, the one Japanese high school graduate, now he's actually working for MIT Media Lab, and he's, he doesn't have a college degree. So I think we just need to recognize that uh, um, with the power of technology and information, kids have so much access to knowledge that uh, we've never conceived before, and they have tools and low-cost opportunities to enable those, right, with open source. And uh, Airbnb is, is developed out of, like, I heard, uh, mostly open source technologies. So I think we just need to kind of bring them closer together. Yeah, well, I, uh, let me just follow on that, that point. So my youngest uh, friend uh, is, uh, is a guy called Yamauchi-kun. Uh, he's 16 years old, a uh, high school student who is launching uh, his, uh, his online payment company in Japan. So as, as you said, I think I see, I, mean, I, I try to be really always optimistic because I'm also a tech entrepreneur background. So, but I see some diversity happening and then especially younger generation uh, talking about the risk taking attitude. I think it's, it's already there. Uh, and I hope uh, he could be really a good uh, example uh, of those uh, new startup uh, generation. That's number one. And then number two, uh, talking about Japan, uh, I also I would like to mention two things. One is uh, uh, I think we have a, a good uh, IP around all the all, I mean most of the technology, but they also especially in uh, uh, biotech or fermentation. We here we have uh, Izmo San uh, from Ugrena here, uh, or co uh, the nanotech that should be also applicable in the global market. So uh, uh, and then also risk money is flowing into that market. So that those seed technological seed 
if we can really harness and if we can really leverage uh, to, to toward the global market, providing enough capital, risk capital, I think there could be enough potential for those companies to go global companies. That's number two. And then number three, what makes me also optimistic is uh, uh, there's an example of Recruit. Uh, so Recruit is, uh, of course, as everyone knows, that it's the largest HR company who went public uh, finally, it was like three years back, uh, with a market valuation of $20, $20 billion. And of course, it's, uh, it's not a startup. It's, they started like 40 years back or 50 years back. But they bought a company called Indeed uh, in the US. That's a Google of uh, HR search. Uh, I think it was five years back. And now it's uh, becoming the driving force of the recruit group. So when you check the recruit market, market cap, it's actually doubled. So it, it started with 20 bill, and now it's a 40 billion dollar, which actually shows, for some, uh, uh, in a, in, even in a tech tech field, uh, the company like like Recruit uh, can uh, uh, what they have is of course uh, operation expertise, uh, knowledge expertise in HR, and the capital. And I think what Japanese companies should do more, uh, of course, there will be a bunch of failures uh, from here if we do it more. But uh, 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 having those strengths, uh, and then uh, if we can send, uh, there's a person called Ide Kobasan, uh, he's an ace of a recruit who has, uh, who has done that deal. But I think that after maybe five years, there will be the majority of the HR revenues coming, could come from uh, uh, Indeed. So uh, that's, and then in a larger scale, I think what SoftBank has been doing is also, I mean, of course it's a larger scale, but it's somewhat similar, like deploying uh, or leveraging uh, the capital or accessibility of capital or in this market to the global or technological trend, uh, and then get the next winning horses. I think that's actually what really we could do uh, when, when it comes to what Japan can do uh, more uh, uh, you know, to harness the, the technological innovation or startup ecosystem building. Yeah, indeed is a great uh, success story. They're, they're in my industry. Uh, um, so four or five years ago, they bought the company for a billion dollars. Uh, the revenue was about $80 million. Today, this uh, f uh, fiscal year, the revenue will be $1.2 billion. So in four years, they've 10x uh, the revenue. And their success, I think, story, you know, I don't want to talk about uh, my competitor too much. <laughs> but um, the, the person, Ida Kobasan, who was the, uh, the person in charge of the investment into Indeed, actually went into Indeed by himself, brought three Japanese and just left the company alone. Uh, allowed the company to operate on its own self. And I think uh, Sonsan, Masasan has done that too with many of the successful companies as well. So Indeed, is, it's in the middle of Recruit's IR now. So if you, can, if you wanna take a look at it, uh, you can see the growth of the company. Uh, but Alex, I think we've talked a little bit too much about Japan. Um, from your perspective, right, where is the next big tech startup um, going to come from? Which, I mean, it's, it's a grand question. Country, you know, you know, region, you know, from your eyes, you know, looking at the, uh, the global technology venture business, uh, give us some, some tips on where the next great startup will come from. First, uh, do you want me to give you an answer that you want to hear, or do you want me to give you the real answer? Uh, the last, the latter, please. <laughs> okay, so everywhere but Japan. Okay. Uh, the companies which are going to bring uh, are going to come from India. Extremely, uh, people don't realize that, but people like you was every day in India. One thing which happened 20 years ago in India, it was a service-oriented technology fabric. Now, the Indian engineers and ecosystem has gone up the ladder by inventing IP and creating software and getting into the new phase. So you're finding yourself with great Indian companies, which are software companies, the same as the SAPs of tomorrow, 15 years from now. The, the 30 years ago, when we looked at Infosys, we said, oh, yeah, yeah, this is a bunch of Indians. There are going to be 2,000 of them, maybe 1,500. And now they're the biggest one. And they are doing the same thing to the software industry, which they're going to dominate, one. Two, countries that you don't expect, such as Israel. Three, Silicon Valley, because Silicon Valley has one thing that you don't anticipate, that we don't talk about enough here. If you go to a lab in Sunnyvale, in San Jose, in Palo Alto, the one thing which is gonna surprise you is that you have maybe 15 countries in one lab, 100 square meters. 
You have a, a Russian, a French, a Spanish, a Japanese, a Chinese, and three Indians, two Pakistanis, three Sri Lankan, three Muslim, three et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this is that diversity that you talked about is what makes Silicon Valley great. 50% of the CEOs of companies today in America are not born in America, 50%. So when Mayfield, when Excel, when Kleiner invest, they invest half of them in people who are not born in the country. So the day Japan start to have that diversity and consider that a non-Japanese is still a human being and still could be a great entrepreneur and should give, open the door to them and just give them a chance and they wish can trust him. Because Americans trust everybody and it's the honor code. If you fail, you're fired. But if you succeed, everybody's happy with you. But you need to have that system. You know, when I went to Finland the other day and I was surprised to see Pakistanis, Indian, Russians in Finland. So the global industry is becoming really global. And that is quite important. We need to change that in Japan. If you ask me something, I would change immigration policy to welcome engineers from many countries because that would create an impetus, that would create a diversity and an enthusiasm. And people, you know, this is a country which is going to welcome the Olympics. The real thing in Silicon Valley, it's every day the Olympics for technology. That is it. That is what is happening in Silicon Valley. So create the Olympics and be there. And last to tell you that uh, tomorrow's companies are not going to be today's companies. Technology used to be a sector. Today, technology is the economy. Technology is the economy in construction, in the car industry, in the hospital, in agri-tech, in food tech. Technology has overwhelmed every sector which used to be a marginal sector. Just helped by technology. Technology is it. Um, I have one point on that. I, I, I truly believe diversity will help foster innovation and better performance of the company. According to McKenzie, fifteen percent of gender of diverse. Uh, sorry, gen uh, companies with gender diversity has fifteen percent more better performances than the rest. And um, with ethnic diversity, is actually appalling thirty five percent better performance than the rest. So obviously, there is a, enough research data which supports diversity is better. And in Japan context, it's very challenging to implement the latter. And I think we're starting the former, which is gender diversity, but I think it, we still have a minuscule level of success. If you see the Japanese kandishoku, the management position, it's 6.6%. And at butcho level, like a divisional head level, it's 6%. So I know there is an effort going on, but I, I don't think there is enough um, enough uh, sense of urgency to really kind of promote um, gender diversity, let alone ethnic diversity. So uh, one approach uh, I've taken as people. So Pitex, right, it is an absolute shame to forget 50% of humankind. So one approach PTEX has taken is for us to move headquarter uh, to the, the United States from uh, Japan, and uh, we've moved a lot of our resources also to Singapore. Um, so that, such that from day one, we can think globally. I think if we don't see the, the global markets like, you know, Teresan does in India, I, it's very hard for Japanese people just growing up here to imagine we can be successful in other parts of the world because Japan is one of the unique civilizations, very difficult, different from the rest of the world, language-wise, culture-wise. So I think we can force the structural change for like more Japanese startups to have a heavy, you know, like a HQ functions in Singapore or some other uh, markets, and then once they're successful, they can come back to Japan maybe, you know, with that new culture in mind. Um. Great. Jonathan, I think uh, we're in going into your field about well, being I, uh, <laughs> I, <laughs> Japanese in Japan. I, I, I see an enormous ferment um, in, in these mixed in mixed environments, right? Um, and in Japan, I, I think it can be incredibly helpful. Um, and the fact is, it's actually not hard, it's not so hard to find um, gaijin. Um, <laughs> you know, there, 
there are a bunch of engineers from Silicon Valley who, who would love to work here. Um, and not just engineers, but, but managers as well. Um, and not just Silicon Valley, but all over Asia and Europe as well. Um, I think you know, part of it is, is a willingness and a recognition of the value. Um, and I think it doesn't just exist, it isn't just required in the operating companies, not just in the level of, um, of entre entrepreneurial companies, but at a, uh, at a VC level as well. Because um, the venture capitalists are there to make, obviously to, to provide funds, but also to make, um, to make introductions and to provide advice. And advice based on international experience can be dramatically helpful uh, from a perspective of um, you know, what has worked, what hasn't worked, and, and frameworks uh, from different environments, as well as introducing people um, who are in similar businesses who might be potential buyout, uh, you know, sort of a buyout partners or, um, or business partners of one way or another. Anyway, so I see that as, as an enormous um, opportunity. Great. I think we'll uh, get into the uh, Q&A session. I think we have 15, uh, 18 minutes. We have two questions already. So first, second. Hi, my name is Pei Emerson from Sweden. I know we have a high proportion of high tech startups in Sweden. I myself being an entrepreneur since 50 years, I've got operations in about 25 countries and I have built companies to keep companies. What has amazed me in Sweden is that a very high proportion of the startups are in the entertainment industry. It's music, it's gaming, and it's also shopping online and all those things. And then I'm looking at, and then they, they build to sell as soon as possible. That's also the tradition of today. Then I'm looking at the sector of healthcare and education that takes about between 20 and 30 percent of the economies in most countries, with enormous needs for improvements, new technology. And I wonder, where are you in Asia in that sector with startups? And what kind of ideas, ventures will, in a radical way, change the elderly care system in Japan in the future, uh, the educational system in the future? Here, you want to take a crack at it? <clears throat> yeah. Um, uh, I'm not much familiar with the education industry as a, as a maybe a concept a sector, but uh, for healthcare, it's for sure happening. As uh, from Jap just starting from Japanese perspective, it's a it's an aging society, and uh, the number of uh, doctors is uh, only six hundred thousand doctors, which uh, which is not considered as enough. But there are some backlash from the from the incumbents. So uh, it has to be b solved by tech. Uh, so it's a remote, uh, 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 remote, remote diagnostic or de big database uh, uh, diagnostic. You know, some of those uh, startups are popping up. So it's not only healthcare, but also preventive health. And then talking about other markets is actually even more significant. Uh, like I have invested in several companies in India in that space uh, in diabetes. Uh, to prevent diabetes. Uh, India, uh, you'll be shocked, uh, eight, 80, 80 million diabetes, which is uh, actually the world uh, number two or number three uh, after China or US. So, uh, uh, and then problems could, could not never be solved by the, without the power of technology. So, so some of those uh, mega venture capitals like Sequoia uh, or Axel, they're very heavily in the healthcare industry. Uh, where also it could be somehow related with the policy, but also the low of the level of uh, the how to say perception of the privacy uh, is a little uh, released. How to say it's a little lower, meaning uh, we, people are happy to share the data if they, if we can if we can get uh, any other pro, you know additional benefits. So I think that's actually what I see. Uh, interesting opportunities in the country like India, where the healthcare system has not been developed yet, but uh, the necessity is there and the technology is there, and the sense of uh, privacy is a little lower, so that we can, when it comes to data sharing, uh, it's a little bit uh, or FDA approval kind of thing. Uh, it's more uh, 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 visible uh, for those startups to obtain some of those licenses. So, just my personal perspective, maybe. 
Next question. Marcel. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Marcel. I'm from the Austrian uh, Embassy commercial section. And uh, maybe some people know Austria. It's a very small country, but beautiful. Nobody knows that there are really good tech companies. Um, so uh, there's also a festival called the Pioneers Festivals, where maybe some people know. And uh, I'm responsible for technology and innovation. And I was thinking, like, maybe in Japan, where's the spot in Japan to have something happening like Pioneers? And uh, I heard that Fukuoka is really happening. So actually, I was there with my entrepreneur for friends for three days. Uh, we were very afraid that we can't come back here, or I can come back here because of the typhoon. Uh, but I'm happy to be here and share my experience. It's actually reflecting what uh, everybody said here. Um, there's no really startup scene yet, let's say, in Japan, or it's very limited. And I was discussing with my, my friends and also investors who were in Fukuoka. Um, there's not investment coming to Fukuoka. So now my question would be to uh, all the panelists, um, it, maybe it's a hen and egg question, uh, does there have to be first a startup scene so the capital comes and flows in, or does there have to be first capital so the startups will come? You know, I think I'll, I'll answer that question uh, because um, I'm running a startup currently. Like I said in my uh, opening statement, I think a lot has changed. I think you're uh, definitely on the point. If it was eight, nine years ago, I would say that, uh, you know, there was not, not a big scene. But I think uh, the startup scene uh, has changed a lot. Uh, there are, are there are a lot of people everywhere. I mean, my office is in Shibuya, and I'm sure there's 20, 30, 40, 50, hundreds of startups uh, that are actually communicating with each other. I think that the big problem is that none of the uh, startups speak English, or the, none of the entrepreneurs speak English. I think that's why it's it's difficult for uh, non-Japanese or foreigners to to see the scene. Is that maybe one way to see it? You know. I was educated abroad in the 80s because my dad worked for Yamaha. And a lot of my returnees from abroad friends, they all work for big companies because our dads work for big companies. And you know, we look at our dad's back when we choose our business. And you know, we have a special privilege of being able to speak English or another language other than Japanese and be brought up in a bilingual culture. And none of my friends are in startups, okay? So it's very difficult to probably to see the startup scene from a non-Japanese eye, but there actually are a lot of startups nowadays, and if you want me to guide you to a few of them, I'd be more than happy to, uh, but, and maybe but, you can uh, uh, perceive uh, the difference, uh, Alex, see the difference. Alex, you, you're trying to be nice here. Swim me. You're not serious. Swim, swim. <laughs> Let's be serious. Yeah, yeah go ahead. If you're talking about entrepreneurs, and entrepreneurs want to create global companies, if they don't speak English, they are doomed. They're just doomed. Don't, don't, they're, it's a no-starter. So if there are entrepreneurs, 500, 3,000, 15,000 Japanese great entrepreneurs, and they want to create a global company, they don't have the skill set. This is a fundamental, basic skill set. So, it's nice to say, yes, we have, there are many entrepreneurs. No, they count for zero. So let's be realistic. A great thing I've learned, I've been board members for 72 years in public companies, okay? I, when you accumulate them, right? So, and checkpoint, you know, those can tandem, et cetera. So I can tell you, if you don't make a diagnostic which is brutal, you end up with a, with a situation which is not right. The brutal, realistic thing is that entrepreneurs need to learn English, and this, there's a big problem in this country that I faced in 1987, which is the same 30 years later, where people don't speak English. This is not normal. We are, in Amer we, we are in a world where America is the dominant force here. People should, I'm not American, they should speak English. They should speak at least two or three languages. This is one of the most educated population of the world. So this is not normal. So sorry. No, no. Good. <laughs> um, so that's Next actually question. a privilege and also a disadvantage of Japan, right? Because we have such a wonderful, long culture and languages. Unfortunately, kids have to stick to Japanese language for so long to learn 
all the stuff the, the government wants us to learn, right? So uh, there are definitely experimental schools where they teach dual languages, and I think compared to compared to like ten uh, compared to now, the the kids around ten or younger, there's a lot higher proportion of kids speaking English nowadays. But uh, I think the question is how uh, we will create more practical environments for people to really use English. Next question. Thank you, Swimmy. Greg Story from Dale Carnegie. I've lived in Japan three times total, about 30 years. So I love Japan, and I'm not leaving this country. I'll be dying in this country. I'll be here forever. And I was very impressed in the late 90s when Japan started to loosen up the educational system to incorporate more creativity. And getting away from just rote memorization, I thought, oh, this is fantastic. This is great. So in 2000, under those PISA scores, Japan ranked number one in the world for maths and uh, number six in the world, uh, yeah, sorry, number eight in the world for reading. Three years later, in 2003, it had gone from one in maths down to six and from eighth in reading down to 14, and everyone panicked. Now, how they thought they could possibly get a change in the creative base of the country in education in just three years is a bit of a mystery to me. I thought it would take a bit longer than that, but no long-term view about making a fundamental change in the educational system to have that creativity. And they went back to rote memorization. So you talked before, Emmy, some about you know, education and the need for change. When you look at that fundamental blockage here, how is Japan going to make that switch? They had a go at it, they had the right idea, but they couldn't sustain it. They couldn't say, hey, we're going to go from 1 to 6 or from 8 to 14, but we're going to come back. We're going to come back and be number one in other things. So you just wonder structurally, the way the government thinks about education here, is there any hope for the future? Or are we going to be relying on people like you, Swim, who've come back, you know, got that creative idea? Uh, how are we going to have the homegrown ones? And English, yes, we know English is important, but Japan still struggling with English, just cannot seem to break out and actually get anywhere in the language. When I was a student here in the early 80s, I met Chinese students here. Their English was unbelievable. Right? This is back in the 1980s. They're, they obviously fluent in Mandarin. Their Japanese was incredible, and their English was incredible. I thought, wow. And I looked at my Japanese classmates, you know, I was a Georgie, and I thought, well, none of these people speak English like these guys. The Chinese are going to take over the world. And that's what they've done. So I still have hope for Japan, but I just wonder, where's my hope going to come from? So I'd be interested to hear from the panelists that have some views on that. I have hope for Japan. I have been negative for a long time, but I have great hope for Japan. In, in the startup economy, Hello? Yeah, that's me. So there is a great thing which is called execution skills. And when you look at startups, which I do every day, you have great execution skills in this country. This country is excellent at execution skills. If you take from point to point execution, most likely, and you see that when you talk to the US Army, they tell you, and the Israelis Army, they tell you among the best soldiers are Japanese in the world today. Because the Japanese are the best at executing, they have great execution skills. So I think there's a tremendous potential in this country. People should not give up. You should find ways to create the three or four elements which are important. One, the openness part that we talked about in the diversity <laughs> issue. Two, to find a way to create an ecosystem where there is not 200 and 300, but 10,000 companies, because there are 10,000 finance-backed companies in the States every day every year, and three, to find a whole ambiance where people accept the notion that failure is accepted, that Jonathan was talking about. The norm of a startup is that you fail. The norm of a startup is 95% of people fail. It is not that 95% succeed. The glamorous part of the startup is just for the books, it's just for the movies, right? The reality is that for 20 startups which start, 19 of them go under after two years. That's part of life. So, Okay, we have uh, five minutes left, so we want to start wrapping up. Jonathan, you have any, uh, uh, anything? To, oh, you want to ask one more question? Quick, quick question. 
Well, there's some background to my question, but uh, I've been studying entrepreneurship in Japan. This, I'm Michael Kusumano from uh, MIT. And also the last couple of years, I've been working at uh, Tokyo University of Science, where we've created an entrepreneurship center in cooperation uh, with MIT. Um, and also a new high-tech MBA program and corporate entrepreneurship program. But we've collected a lot of data, and one of the things that struck me is that Japan has such a rich history of entrepreneurs, and, um, and particularly certain periods, late Meiji, early Taisho, uh, 1930s, right after World War II. And so it seems to me the problem is to really kind of rediscover that entrepreneurial energy and uh, so I have a few theories as to what happened to Japan, but it's certainly not the case that Japanese do not know how to create companies. Part of the problem now might be education, might be full employment, risk averseness, but I'm wondering if the panel has any comments on how to get the Japanese to rediscover their past. Any comments? Sure. Um, I think it's related to your education question as well, and um, what Mr. Kusumano is saying. I, I think in education, uh, we have 99% of elementary school kids going to public school and 94% or so to middle school. So we have one amazing system which provides uniform education, which has been working amazingly um, during the industrial era, right? And now with the fourth industrial uh, uh, revolution coming, everybody, including the government, knows that that approach, one fits all, is not going to work anymore. So if you look at the 2020, the new education policy guideline, I think there are a lot of great um, suggestions about how we respect every kid's kind of active learning skills or you know ability to develop creativity and critical thinking. The question is execution, right? How do we execute that higher level concept to every single school? Which I think is where Japan has the most difficult time. And if you look at the examples of America, there are a lot of, lot of alternative schools which is funded by tech entrepreneurs like Mark Zuckerberg, um, where you know uh, a new tech powered um, kind of alternative education like OutSchool can gather, you know, $50, $100 million to start entirely new education system within the boundary of, of, obviously, you know, education guidelines, but a more individualized approach, more uh, approach to, to value uh, every kid's willingness to create. So I think we need to kind of, you know, if we invest lots of money into startups, why not investing more also money into um, creating a new you know, new types of schools where we can start creating role models, um, like an incubator, right? I think in Japan, we don't have enough uh, angel investors or people who have philanthropic mind to, to really invest in those kind of new types of education. And in the States, I do have, you know, even personally have five to 10 friends who've already, you know, exited from companies and start putting money back into education. So I think we need kind of concerted approach to, to create new education environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's a tough question to answer, and uh, hopefully we can discuss this even after this topic. We're running out of time. I'd like to give everyone you know, one quick moment, maybe one phrase uh, to wrap up today's uh, uh, session, um, starting with Jonathan. What would you say? I'm going to give you 10 seconds to think about it, <laughs> to blabber on. You know, um, one key statement to, to wrap up today's session. Just, just reiterating the, the point that I uh, made earlier, I think that there is tremendous uh, potential. I think what it requires is greater internationalization. By that, I don't mean slogans all over the place saying, be international. Um, I mean sending kids overseas. I mean bringing more people in from other countries in Asia and, and Europe and the US um, to, to help create great companies. I, I think it's very simple. Um, I think Japan needs something of a shock to the system. Um, I know that I provide that in my household, um, but that in, in general, you know, foreigners can, can provide that, that sort of shock. Uh, and so, Great. you know, urge that. Kurohune. Hi. Emi-san? Oh, okay, Teru. I think it's role model. So assume that, uh, let's say, if you're one of your school friends become billionaire, then, of course, we'll be 
energized. And I think when I think it, it also happened in the baseball or soccer, like Nomo Hideo went to Los Angeles, and then afterwards, with a bunch of bunch of major league players have, coming from. Same for soccer. He, Kazuo Hideo, you know. So I think that role model approach is pretty practical in Japan. And uh, if everyone is doing startup, and of course there'll be you know, more startups. So not everyone, but if 10 out of 100 would do the startup, then I think the, there will be a tipping point for Japanese society to really go, you know, go forward. Alex, uh, final comments? A few comments. words. Globalize, critical mass, volume of entrepreneurs, uh, tolerance for failure, and obviously, uh, appetite for money, understanding what money is about, so that money just doesn't look dirty. So that if people are hungry and really want to make money, they will make it. But uh, when people are just debonair about money, they don't become great entrepreneurs. Great, thank you. If you look back at the history of Japan, I think to, to wrap up everyone's comments, if you look back 150 years ago, after the, uh, the Edo period, you know, Okubo and all those guys went abroad for, you know, a year and a half, picked up a lot of the ideas from overseas, even like the Japanese constitution was uh, based off of the German constitution, I believe. And then after World War II, I think we copycatted, you know, everywhere else in the world. I think benchmarking, you know, global trends in, and global technology is one way that this country has changed over the last 50, 150 years. So I think uh, looking overseas, sending our kids abroad, um, and taking ideas and taking our destiny in our own hands, I think, is one way that uh, our country, country will grow going forward. So thanks, everybody, for, for your time and the audience, uh, and hope to see everyone contribute to the future. Thank you. <laughs>